Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever, whatever part of the world you are. Thanks for joining us on this webinar that is jointly organized by the Society of Gynecology and Obstetrics of Nigeria and the European Endometriosis League. And on the special webinar talking about adenomyosis. And this is probably, I cannot recall any other place where there has been a webinar on adenomyosis, either in Nigeria or in West Africa that I can recall. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing this, because we've seen that it's probably one of the most misdiagnosed conditions in the female pelvis. And it's, we think it's something that is worthy to be spoken about. Majority of the people also, or let me say some of the people that we diagnose with uterine fibroids, and we know how common fibroids are in this environment, also either have adenomyosis or they actually have adenomyosis and it's been misdiagnosed. So today we have a very rich panel to discuss this, both local and uh, uh, international. And um, we expect the president of the Society of Gynecology and Obstetrics to also join. And then also we have Dr. Kinsley Agolo, who will be introducing uh, better on, later on. And then we have uh, Anne Stinenberg, and then we have Tara Krentel, and Professor Ali from Sh uh, Shanghai. So while Krentel and uh, Hans are from Germany, of course, Dr. Agolo is from Nigeria like myself. So we'll be, we hope to have a cross fertilization of ideas and see how we can uh, improve the knowledge and the diagnosis of this condition in this environment. So um, I think without much ado, we will not, since the president of Sogon is still being expected, I think we better just kick things, set things rolling. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Agolo, and then so that I can uh, take the floor and start with, because one of the things is that we need to make a diagnosis first before we can even talk about treating adenomyosis, and that's where it comes in. We know the ultrasound is something that is quite portable and almost freely available everywhere, and therefore, we think it's something that will help us in the diagnosis of adenomyosis. So, Dr. Kinsley Agolo is a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist, is a sonologist and endoscopic surgeon, is a fellow of the West African College of Surgeons and fellow of the National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria. He has authored many articles in both local and international journals. But what fascinate me, fascinates me about him is his interest in ultrasound. And since, like I said, ultrasound is really very freely available, I think it's a low-hanging fruit for a low-resource economy like ours to be able to make more diagnosis of adenomyosis. So, uh, Dr. Kinsley Agolo, it's so great to have you. Please. You can sh uh, share your screen now and uh, you have the microphone. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. It's an excitement for me to be here, um, to be part of this uh, process. Um, so I thank you, your organizers, for inviting me to come and discuss the ultrasound diagnosis of this enigmatic disease, adenomyosis with a focus on the Nigerian experience. I have no disclosures to make, so my pocket is empty. <laughs> All right. Adenomyosis, uh, yes. Adenomyosis has always been considered the classic condition of multiparous women aged over, over 40 years, aged 40 years and over. Uh, these women usually have chronic pelvic pain and abnormal uterine and or abnormal uterine bleeding. With the condition believed to be diagnosed, possibly only from histological examination of hysterectomy specimen of those women that are uh, treated surgically. Sadly, evidence in Nigeria indicates that we have not moved from this long-held belief, despite the fact that the epidemiology 
the biomedical scenario has changed completely with, with advances in uh, imaging techniques. First, with MRI in this paper by Togashi in 1988, and later with ultrasound in this work by Livy Fedele in 1992. These advances in imaging techniques have shown that adenomyosis have shown improvement in adenomyosis diagnosis with identification of uh, uh, sonography feature, features of adenomyosis uh, in young women of reproductive age. As far back as 1986, Minige and my teacher, Professor Eugene Okwere, showed that we in Nigeria were actually at par with the rest of the world in recognizing that there were challenges, recognizing that there were challenges with diff, diff, or difficulties in the diagnosis of adenomyosis and to work towards the prevention or elimination of its frequent misdiagnosis as uterine fibroids at surgery. But by 1991, while the rest of the world was moving forward with ultrasound and MRI, our diagnosis in Nigeria was still mostly post-operative, and we still believed that adenomyosis was common as a multiparous human in the fifth decade of life. By 2019, we had gone full cycle back to 1986 with adenomyosis believed to be commoner in the fourth decade of life and retrospective histology after hysterectomy still the diagnostic tool for the disease in Nigeria. And just last year here in 2020, right in the heart of the middle of COVID, age of four and others working in Inewi examined adenomyosis and uterine fibroids and reached the conclusion that histological examination is the only tool, the only tool to differentiate adenomyosis from uterine fibroids. Again, the highest number of cases that they saw were women in their fifth decade of life. Is the global narrative different? Yes, I mentioned that earlier and provided the evidence as well. That transvaginal ultrasound and magnetic resonance imaging have improved the diagnosis and led to the identification of adenomyosis in young nulliparous women of fetal age, not just multiparous women in their fifth decade of life. Let's talk about ultrasound. That's why we are here. And so we find that with ultrasound, the disease is actually indeed common in younger women with identification of endometrial line myometrial cysts and their association to adolescents and young women in this work by the Seven Gods group. Pinzati and Katrina Isakutu's group showed us how young these women can truly be with a demonstration or documentation of sonographic features of diffuse adenomyosis in young 18 year old and or 30 year old women who have never been pregnant. Their effort showed us that adenomyosis actually develops earlier in reproductive life than we previously thought. In fact, Zanoni et al. showed us again that the disease can be found in adolescents and that the prevalence of adenomyosis in young women, their own population of young women presenting with pelvic pain amounted to about 46%. All of this with ultrasound. So we need to up the stakes in pre-surgical diagnosis of adenomyosis in Nigeria. We really need to ask questions whether histology is still the gold standard for the diagnosis of adenomyosis. Because the evidence in Nigeria that histology is the gold standard for the diagnosis of adenomyosis and that the disease is common or most common in older women, older multiparous women, means that the condition will be largely underdiagnosed. I mean, you are not going to take a young, nulliparous woman, 28-year-old woman with chronic pelvic pain and or abnormal uterine bleeding and perform hysterectomy 
just because you want to relax if she has adenomyosis. So there will be diagnostic delays. And with it are uh, the attendant problems of application of the wrong treatment or misapplication of treatment by clinician. So clearly, there's a need for pre-surgical diagnosis using non-invasive diagnostic methods like MRI or transvaginal scan. Indeed, when the results of transvaginal scan and MRI were compared with histological findings, the outcome showed that these, um, uh, these um, uh, imaging techniques correlated very well with histological diagnosis of hysterectomy specimen. In simple terms, transvaginal scan, MRI, and histology all compare together in the diagnosis of adenomyosis. None is superior to the other. This evidence led the authors of this meta-analysis and systematic review to recommend transvaginal scan as the first line diagnostic imaging technique. Of course, transvaginal scan is widely available. Uh, uh, of course, therefore more accessible, better tolerated by patients and cheaper than MRI leaving MRI as a second line treatment only if transvaginal scan is inconclusive. And transvaginal scan will be inconclusive. Uh, I mean, we can remove the inco it will be very few or none at all. If transvaginal scan is performed by dedicated sonographers who can identify distinct ultrasound pattern of uh, required in the diagnosis of adenomyosis. And so truly, uh, Professor Hysent Honor and his uh, team of fertility specialists demonstrated the sonographic features of adenomyosis in the population of young infertile women in Nigeria. This is the only evidence documenting ultrasound finding of adenomyosis in the Nigerian population. However, uh, but they did not actually state the exact uh, sonographic features of adenomyosis that they identified. Nonetheless, they identified these features in only 2% of their population. Recall from the evidence I provided here today that the estimated prevalence from histological diagnosis in Nigeria is about 10%. So why do we have these variants? These variants may be explained by inconclusive ultrasound reports like the one presented to us by this 28-year-old lady. She came to us seeking resolution of infertility, having been trying to get pregnant for the past two years. She also complained of uh, severe dysmenorrhea and deep dyspareunia. She came with two ultrasound scan reports. The first one, this one here, was done on the 10th of August and the sonographer used first the transabdominal probe, and then he described the liver, the gallbladder, the kidney, the pancreas, spleen, bowels, and then he used the transvaginal probe to image the uterus and describe the uterus as normal in size, antiverted, and non gravid Now, what is normal in size? The exact measurement ought to have inputted in this report so we are sure that the operator's subjective judgment is not uh, in doubt. Because of course, uh, Sakel and our friend Abu Mohammed showed us that globular uterine enlargement that is generally up to 12 cm in uterine length that is not explained by the presence of fibroid is a characteristic finding of adenomyosis. So, we lose that information because the measurement is not there. And he described again the myometrium as uh, measures identified a tiny fibroid mass noted at the uterine wall and measures that. So conclusion was that features are in keeping with tiny uterine fibroids. But infertility persisted, dysmenorrhea persisted, and deep dysbarina persisted. So as is common in Nigeria, patients drive their own treatment. And so she presented STR for another ultrasound scan. So she had a second ultrasound scan on the 27th of August, about 17 days apart. And in the report, we noticed 
that the uterine length now measures approximately 11 centimeters and that the uterus is suddenly bulky. Importantly, the sonographer notes that there are ill-defined echogenic areas involving the posterior and fundal myometrial regions. These are attempts used for the description of adenomyosis. The sonographer acknowledges the association of these terms with adenomyosis in his final report, where he notes query background adenomyosis, and the patient is advised to seek confirmation of his findings using the transfer channel scan. So she presented to us. And when I scanned her, I saw, using a transfer channel probe, of course, I saw a bulky uterus. Measuring 12.4 by 8.5 by 7.7 .7 centimeter. Therefore, our findings are in keeping with that of Sakan Abu Ahmed, that measurement greater than 2, 12 centimeter, not uh, where the uterine fibroids are not seen, may be associated with adenomyosis. So we decided to look at it again. What else did we see? We saw global fonda enlargement, and then we saw small myometra cysts. And then we saw shadows, and we saw shadows, and then we saw indistinct endometria, myometria junction, and then we saw echogenic islands. All of these are terms that are used to describe adenomyosis. Now, why did we have those inconclusive or misleading reports initially? Why should we have uh, inconclusive reports at all? We found answers in this unpublished data where we sampled fertility specialists in order to better understand barriers to utilization of gynecological ultrasound. And what did we find? We found that the major reason why we have inconclusive or misleading reports concerning adenomyosis is lack of ultrasound scan skill. Menakaya and I, in this paper, identified the apparent lack of ultrasound scan skill to be due to the absence of former training programs with many images, sonographer sonologists being often self-taught, unlike in high-income countries where gynecological ultrasound is a core, is a, is, a, is a part of the core curriculum for specialty training. So in training, sonographers will learn how to identify the sonographic features of adenomyosis in order to avoid misdiagnosis. Language really matters. And so this consensus statement from the Musa group present, has presented us with both a language to describe the sonographic features of adenomyosis and a system of how to identify it. I invite you to read the paper because again, it also provides guidance on how to distinguish uterine fibroids clearly from adenomyosis. So further refinement of definition by the Musa group has led to the recognition of the sonographic features of adenomyosis as primary features or secondary features. The primary features usually uh, they are more, they signify the presence of ectopic endometrium and they are seen on ultrasound, they are also called Direct, direct, feet, direct signs that are seen on ultrasound as myometrial seas, hyperechogenic islands, or, or some of them demetrial lines and boards. While the secondary features, also called indirect features, you know, just are indicators, indicators secondary to the presence of um, atopic endometrium. So you may see them on ultrasound as asymmetrical thickening of the myometrial wall. Um, because of the distribution, localized distribution of the adenomyotic tissues. Here in this place, they are distributed more to the posterior wall. So you see posterior wall thickening. And where there is a uniform distribution of the adenomyotic lesion, you see global uniform enlargement of the myometrium. You may also see fan-shaped shadowing, transitional vascularity, and then the endometrial myometrial junction may be interrupted or it may be irregular. Now, recall that in the first 
scan from the clinical case uh, presentation that we, clinical case scenario we presented, the sonographer used both the transabdominal probe and the transvaginal probe. The second sonographer used the transvaginal probe. But adenomyosis is best visualized using the transvaginal probe. Why? But it's not possible to get a good image resolution with a transabdominal scan to enable a reliable distinction between adenomyosis and uterine fibers. So what is recommended? It is recommended that the transvaginal probe, transvaginal scan should be the primary tool in all clinical cases of suspected adenomyosis. However, in Nigeria, there are still some reservations about the acceptability of the transvaginal probe or transvaginal scan as a diagnostic tool. However, these most recent uh, publications showed us, uh, they concluded that um, the transvaginal ultrasonography is universally acceptable to women in Nigeria and recommend that ultrasound scan providers should acquire this key for transvaginal scan and then aim to use it routinely in all gynecological evaluation. And when eventually this key is acquired, what will these ultrasound providers see? Look at this image. They will see that the fundus of the uterus is enlarged globally. They will also notice asymmetry in the anterior and posterior myometrial wall. But like we said, these are secondary signs or indirect signs, secondary features. So you look deeper. You ask yourself, why do I see these things? When you look deeper, you see loss of endometrial myometrial junction, and then you see shadows, see shadows, more in the transverse image, you see shadows, and then you see myometrial cyst, myometrial cyst, and then you see echogenic islands. So when you put your probe and you scan the patient, the first thing you see are indirect signs. Then you ask yourself, why do I see these signs? Let me show you some video examples. Now, Bloom and Maji Doham actually um, showed that uh, we, we learned from them that sonographic features of adenomyosis are best demonstrated using uh, video clips. So I'll show you my own videos. These are my own videos. Uh, so in this video, in this video, you see that the uterus is globularly enlarged, again, more at the fundus. And then as you scan, you see a fibroid nodule and you shout to the car, the fibroid nodule must be the reason for the enlargement. And you decide to measure it. And what do you find? You have uh, 0 0.8 by 1.2, by 1.12%. No, no, that's, it cannot be. That's like a seed of granules. That cannot be the reason for the enlargement, 0 0.8 by 1.2. So you scan further, and then you see asymmetry of the anterior and posterior myometrial wall. And then you see that the anterior myometrial wall appears uh, wider than the posterior myometrial wall. And then you notice that the myometrium is heterogeneous, hyperechoic areas, hyperechoic areas in the anterior wall. So what do you do? You, you, you scan further. You scan further to look at this region of interest, the anterior myometrial wall that has hyperechogenic uh, lesions right there. So you zoom your image, you zoom in your image. Zoom in your image, and then you see the hyperechogenic areas. What do you see? Myometrial cyst. Myometrial cyst. See the cyst with the echogenic ring, cyst with the echogenic ring, cyst with the echogenic ring. So, and then you, you switch on your Doppler just to see what type of vascularity is this. You switch on your Doppler. Yeah, switch on the Doppler. You see the uh, cogenic uh, ring, myometrial cyst, Doppler is coming soon. Myometrial cyst, Doppler is coming soon. Switch on the Doppler. Yes, switch on the Doppler. And then we see translational vascularity. The vessels go through the lesion 
as if there is no lesion. Okay. Now, let us look at our fibroid node and see the type of vascularity the fibroid has. Look, this is where the fibroid is. You will see circular flow. See circular flow. This thing from this transition of vascularity of the adenomyosis. Look at it. See circular flow here. Just telling you where the fibroid is. This thing that. So the fibroid lesion is well defined. The adenomyosis lesion is ill-defined. That's the difference. Now, let us look at the junctional zone. Again, look at the junctional zone in this image. Look at how the anterior myometrial junction is well demonstrated, very clearly demonstrated. And you see that the posterior zone not well demonstrated. See that? So see, well demonstrated here. Again, look at this image. This um, little overhead uterus. You see, global fundal enlargement, yes. But what strikes you first are the shadows. Look at the shadows, fan shaped shadows. Fan shaped shadows. Look at the shadows, fan shaped shadows. And then you see, why do we have these shadows? You zoom in again, and then you see, you see the myometrasis, echogenic cream, myometrasis, echogenic cream, myometrasis, echogenic cream. So you see that, you see that. These are the features of adenomyosis. Again, if you switch on your Doppler, you see translational flow. You see translational flow. Okay. So how did this cyst really appear? Look at it. The cysts are an echo in structures surrounded by echogenic ring. Look at the cyst here. They are the single most reliable um, sign for the diagnosis of adenomyosis. So you see cyst here, cyst here, echogenic islands all over. Then you see shadows, you see shadows, that's the, in the direction of the ultrasound beam, it's ultrasound is generated by, by, by the, by the um, waveforms, you see that. So when you see shadows, there must be a reason why the shadows exist. And here it is quite simple. So I, I put this image, this video, so we can understand how the shadows arise. So we have here a cyst, um, quite a large cyst, and just below the cyst, you see um, acoustic enhancement. You see that acoustic enhancement. And on either side, you see edge shadow. So we see a large cyst, we see acoustic enhancement, retroacoustic enhancement, and then we see shadows on either side. Now, if it was a smaller cyst, you would just see linear hyperechoic stripe alternating with linear hypoechoic stripe, you know, so like this one. Yeah, a good example of shadows. You see that? Hyperechoic shadows, hyperechoic lines, stripes, alternating hyper. If you move up, you see the cyst. Look at the cyst here. You just saw a cyst. So it's actually um, shadows alternating with retroacoustic enhancement, shadows, retroacoustic enhancement, shadows, retroacoustic enhancement in a grossly enlarged uterus. And if uh, with further ski development and better machines, we'll be able to see sub-endometrial lines and boards. And then you look at it, you see the sub-endometrial lines and boards, see This must be distinguished from um, echogenic, um, echogenic uh, spots, uh, which are actually progenitors of echogenic islands. And so here you also see the uh, sub-endometrial lines and boards just below the endometrial, infiltration of the endometrial myometrial junction. And if you have 3D, you can reconstruct the uterus, and then you'll be able to see the actual infiltration of the uh, endometrial myometrial junction like this. Look at how beautiful this area is. And then you see the infiltration in the corner point here. Again, the lateral uh, left side wall here, you see the infiltration. They are usually perpendicular lines perpendicular lines between the myometrial wall. Hello. Hello.
we need to say ah. Was I was I muted? Hello. Yeah, you are off, you are off for some time. Yeah, you're back. So go on. Hmm. Yeah, that is the broadband. <laughs> the, the broadband. So um. We might pause for a few minutes to allow Dr. Agolo to come back. Yeah, I must say that Dr. Agolo is not in Lagos, he's in a part of Nigeria called Worry. And so uh, sometimes this happens. <laughs> Hello. I back now. Yeah, you're back. Am I back now? Yeah, yeah, you are. Okay, Let's so can back. my screen come back? Sure, 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 sure. Oh, my okay. screen, can my screen come back? Can my screen yes. come back, please? Yeah, yeah. One minute. So, yes. Hmm? That's your... You have to share your screen again. Can my screen? Okay. You have to share your screen again. Yes. Yes, share it again. Chat, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, am I back? Open book, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 you're good. Okay, good. So, I, like, I, like I was saying, I, I was saying that um, I hope we all follow the aspect. Um, can I go back? Where can I go back? Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I talked about uh, the possibility of 3D reconstruction of the uterus and then us being able to, of course, see junctional zone infiltration. And, and that, um, that's where we were before I got um, uh, cut off. Okay, so now we see that it is possible to diagnose adenomyosis using ultrasound. So it is quite sad that despite the availability of this knowledge, adenomyosis continues to be misdiagnosed in Nigeria. And that surgeons continue to be surprised by what they find at surgery. And patients continue to be surprised to learn of surgical findings when they are awake. Many times going back home with the problems that brought them to the hospital in the first instance, problems of abnormal uterine bleeding, pain, dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia, some fertility and challenges with you know, a poor obstetric outcome. This needs to stop. Menakai and I provide solutions along three needs. One, provision of good ultrasounds can be seen with, of course, access for servicing, repairs, and, and um, maintenance. But we talked about training, training, and retraining, it never ends. And of course, we talked about the need for accurate reporting of ultrasound scan images using technological tools like um, DISCOM or even um, prepared available uh, templates for gynecological ultrasound scan reporting like um, uh, 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 the forms that are available. Uh, uh, sorry about this. 
Yes, we could use um, mono, mono echo or viewpoints. Those are uh, systems that are valuable that can be used uh, in our setting. So let me summarize all of this for you. Yes, ultrasound scan diagnosis of adenomyosis is um, available in Nigeria. But what we know is that Available evidence indicate that we are still lagging behind the global community in the appropriate use of transvaginal ultrasound as the first tool for the diagnosis of adenomyosis. As a result, misdiagnosis of adenomyosis and application of inappropriate treatment continues in Nigeria. Researchers have identified lack of training as a major challenge. Therefore, there is a need to provide training opportunities if we are to improve accuracy in ultrasound diagnosis of adenomyosis, especially as treatment options, including high full surgery, are available now. Thank you. Thank you so very Thank much. You. Thank you so very much, Dr. Agolo. You, you put it so clearly, um, the, the need for us to be able to diagnose adenomyosis pre-surgery. Because that, that's whether for surgery or for IVF, that is when the patient can benefit, not after. So, and you have highlighted the importance of training. So thank you so very much. Um, I have uh, the pleasure of inviting the next speaker uh, to, now that we've made, been able to make the diagnosis of adenomyosis, surgery for adenomyosis, and uh, Hans Tenenberg will be talking about this. So, Hans Steinberg is not a stranger to many of us um, in all these endometriosis things that we organize. We know that he's a pioneer president of the European Endometros Endometriosis League. He has authored so many publications and uh, he's on a very limited time uh, schedule today because he has a family thing to do. But thank you so much, Hans, for creating time to talk to us about surgery for adenomyosis. So I hand over to you, Hans. Thank you, Yomi. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be with you. And uh, I hope that uh, we might be able to, uh, to uh, extend this uh, in the future to come. Um, and as you said, we have uh, spoken about endometriosis related topics uh, before, and I hope we will do in the future. Now, um, I am very grateful to the previous speaker, Dr. Akulor, because he had stated something that I think might change the entire attitude to um, endometriosis, including adenomyosis. And it's only because of that that I also took one uh, ultrasound picture, this is a 3D pic, and you can see the disproportion, all the other signs that uh, Dr. Akolo had shown. And uh, I would like to, to add one aspect, and I will come back to this at the end of my talk. Um, we have the privilege of doing the ultrasound or the diagnosis and the treatment in one hand. So it should be that um, uh, also, the surgeon should learn to read these, uh, uh, these ultrasound findings because ultrasound is not only easier available, but it is also a dynamic um, investigation. And therefore, we can have an excellent approach to this uh, type of disease. This is an MRI finding, and uh, um, I had this because um, the advice that I have heard most by gynecologists is, okay, sorry, um, we now know that you have uh, are suffering from adenomyosis and we recommend hysterectomy. This is no option for women that have uh, still not completed their family planning. And uh, if they wanna have a child by themselves, then they need the uterus, full stop. There's, uh, there's no discussion about this. And uh, this is why um, I am propagating 
not to um, further um, entertain the idea of hysterectomy, but to look at other options. And um, I'm very grateful to, uh, to Dr. Yumi Abayi that he has also alternatives to, to certain ways. And of course, uh, what we can do is site reduction. We can try a complete uh, excision. We have non-surgical interventions. And we also, in some options, might have medical therapy. Up to date, medical therapy for particularly extensive adenomyosis, mainly diffuse adenomyosis, was the only way, uh, especially in case of infertility, that was um, recommended. And uh, I'm sure that uh, Dr. Abayi uh, know, knows all the stimulation protocols, including uh, long-term GnRH analog downstaging. What I would very much like to talk about is complete excision, which is sort of conflicting with uh, site reduction. Now, perhaps uh, some of you know <clears throat> a surgical technique that has been propagated by Osada from Japan. Um, the, the technique that I am practicing <clears throat> um, is slightly different from this because um, uh, my former teacher had um, uh, propagated a technique similar to this, but in a, in a slightly different way. But this, this picture is fine, I think, to explain what it uh, works like. So what we do is we place a tourniquet around <clears throat> the ascending branches of uh, the uterine artery. We also have a tourniquet around uh, the ovarian vessels so that the ovaries will still be perfused. We do not uh, set a clamp here, but we set a clamp here and the tubes will recover. So there is a tourniquet here on both sides and a tourniquet at the isthmocervical level. Then we split the uterus in two parts. Uh, probably this is not very obvious because we split that we also open uh, the uterine cavity. Then, um, and I'm doing this with a mini laparotomy. I, I take, uh, sorry, I take uh, the uterus out uh, in front of uh, the abdominal wall <clears throat> and then excise with a bipolar scissor, I excise all the affected tissue by having one finger in the uterine cavity and uh, with the um, bipolar dissecting scissor, I excise the tissue, leaving part of um, uh, the um, junctional zone intact, as well as part of the subserous um, uh, normal myometrium. There's always normal myometrium, sometimes only a very thin layer um, um, in this area, and there's, this is also some healthy tissue. So if you like, this is um, uh, um, the maximum way of site reductive uh, way of going about. Here you can see, there is uh, the, the finger is um, in uh, the, the, the uterine cavity. This is the bipolar um, scissor by Erbe, called bisect. And I dissect uh, this, uh, this tissue and uh, remove it on, uh, in, in four areas uh, where there's the, the main diffuse adenomyosis at the posterior anterior wall and the same at the posterior wall left and right sided. So there are four areas where, where to dissect. Here you can see this is also going uh, close to uh, the, uh, the uterine cavity. Here you can see that there's little normal tissue left uh, so as we also try to remove even small islets of uh, this tissue. And here is um, a short video that shows you all the tissue um, of the, all the adenomyotic tissue has been removed. And now we suture the, uh, the edges of the uterine cavity with Vicro. Uh, Vicro uh, 3 0, sometimes 2 0, depending on how uh, thick the, the tissue is. And this, these are sutures without any forceful uh, um, knotting. So this is uh, just for approximation. We do not want that there are uh, um, rough edges inside the uterine cavity. The uterine cavity, because of the endometrium, has uh, a high capacity 
of reforming the layer uh, of, uh, of uh, the uterine cavity. And this is what we can trust uh, to, um, to depend on. And you can see there's very little oozing uh, that's because of the, the tourniquet. And some people have asked for how long can we leave uh, the tourniquet. The tourniquet, I think, can be left up to six hours or even more. The uterus is extremely resistant to ischemia, but we do not need uh, to have this. So, and now we will do additional incisions in order to have flaps that are overlying, because what we want to do is we want to reconstruct the uterus, and that's why I'm uh, doing an uh, additional incision in order to have an overlapping of uh, the tissue to strengthen the uterine wall. Basically, this is the, the most creative work. And uh, <clears throat> this is why it is always a new challenge because uh, what we have to aim for is we have to reform the uterus in a way that there are hardly any pockets left behind because we do not want that there are uh, seromas developing or that there are hematomas in uh, these, these layers. And you can see uh, what we do is we, we fold um, the tissue in a way that we have overlapping, also uh, filling uh, the possible gaps with um, uh, healthy tissue. And this is now uh, no longer Vicro. This is um, PDS because PDS takes much longer to um, lose uh, its, uh, its strength. It takes about uh, three months in order to have half the pulling uh, strength. And now, as you can see, uh, this has been the first or the second layer. And this is now the third layer which is also used in order to cover up the entire tissue. And uh, we pull it together. Sorry, this is a head camera. So um, if someone is looking for something, by the way, uh, the, the cameraman is, uh, uh, my dear and respected co-worker, um, Dr. Alin Konstantin. Who is also doing this type of work in a very, very nice manner. And you can see we are covering it, reconstructing the uterus so that in the end, the shape looks similar to what it should have looked under normal conditions, as you can see. So this is now the uterus. We remove the tourniquet, and this is how the uterus looks now. And in order to reduce the chance of developing uh, uh, seromas in there, what we also do is we place, we place U suture, in order to, as you can see, there's a straight needle and it goes front to back through the uterus. It is an, an U suture, a U suture. And this U is in order to compress from outside. It also goes through the uterine cavity to compress uh, the, uh, uh, all these layers so that there is less chance of developing a seroma or even a hematoma. Okay, in order to avoid adhesion formation, uh, we will perform thorough rinsing and sometimes we even apply an uh, uh, anti -adhes adhesion uh, device uh, in order to prevent uh, this from so this is what it this is a different case but this is how it might the the tubes have 
because uh, now uh, is um, being uh, removed. Even um, uh, introduced a also uh, a, um, we also propagate to use the there is FA which stands for adenomyosis for endometriosis and this classification. pre-surgical so that the patient less of my disease in imaging how long will the surgery take and that you after other aspects that might not have been seen the uh, the frankfurt way of uh, the osasa contribution to having not only more to showing up ways of how to deal with those and for all of that we need more awareness then it would be passed through frankfurt or being there and uh, let's discuss things together if you like yeah, thank you so very much, Hans. Yes, um, definitely. Just wait for COVID to go by, and then I'm sure some of your listeners will take up the knocking on your door in Frankfurt. Anyway, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we'll just, um, I think we take all the questions together. So, oh, but you need to, to run. Can we just take a few questions? Do you want? Are you? Can we just take a few questions? Yeah, but number four. Oh, um, I got the sign. The internet uh, connection is a little in. So uh, let's let's try it. If if not, I see that. Uh, the, um, active. If I cannot answer this doing so but please let's try okay um all right and i i, I have a first question to start with. have you tried to look um stereoscopically at the you try that you have done this reconstruction for have, have you look try to look at it what what did you find if, if you have done that Yes, we have looked at it. We looked at it. We did not see um, intra. To be afraid of, and uh, uh, we did not see any hysteroscopic related topics. I think mm -hmm. uh, uh, an excellent speaker to show this, but most important. Involved in infertility treatment. These were highly fertile, even though they, they had with IVF, ICSI, and, and what have you. So it really helped them having a baby. I think what we just do is we get you to answer the questions. I think the internet is not the, our, our best friend here now. We just get you to answer the questions and then we, we can read the questions. Is that okay? Great. Okay, I think what we just do, can so, we... Um, uh, uh -huh. Go on, go on. Me the questions or are... 
you have a lot of questions. So Sorry, maybe um, can you understand everything? Oh yeah. Then we we, we we can even send some of them to you to answer, no problem. It is instable. So yeah, I know, I know. We we just let it go. Thanks. You I'll be sure that I'm gonna bombard you with the questions. Uh, um, Yomi, if, if you don't mind, perhaps um, if people are really interested in this, um, you can, um, can send me there. Or alternatively, um, I see that uh, Harald is. I'll have this talking next after you now, so yeah. Internet connection is better, so that he might answer this question. Okay. Thank you so much. So, Harad, you sorry, have... I'm um... Sorry if I'm holding you. <laughs> no problem, no problem, Hans. You, you attend to what you've got to do, okay? Thank you for being part of this. As Hans, usual, you're always very helpful. Harald, so you have... Um, you have an extra headache added onto you now. <laughs> As Thank we come you. to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> As As I will be uh, happily answer the questions. <laughs> yeah, so let me just introduce the next speaker. Yeah, I can see from all the comments that people are really having a good time with all this. Adenomyosis is a topic we cannot uh, uh, be tired of talking about. So my, the next speaker is uh, Harald Krentel. Is a specialist, of course, gynecologist and obstetrician, and then uh, the certified gynecological oncologist and the uh, specialist in minimally invasive surgery. Especially, he specialized in stereoscopic and laparoscopic procedures in adenomyosis, including adenomyomectomy and cytoreductive procedures in infertility. Um, Krentel is a very important and very active member of the EEL. And uh, so he'll be sharing the experience with us. Krenter, uh, Dr. Krenter, is really my um, pleasure to have you here today. And now that you also have, uh, you have inherited part of uh, <laughs> Hans' uh, questions there, yeah, we, we tend to, we're going to have a lovely time talking to you today. So, Harald, I just let you do your thing. Okay, then. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> yeah, first of all, thank you so much for your very kind introduction and uh, the invitation. I'm very happy and it's a, it's a big pleasure for me to be with you today. I think it's an excellent um, idea to have a webinar just on adenomyosis as it is a very, very important um, area of, of patients with endometriosis. Uh, we, we, shouldn't all, we should always think in all our patients with endometriosis, also in adenomyosis. And I would like to congratulate uh, the previous speakers for the excellent uh, lectures, especially uh, ultrasound is the most important tool in uh, the detection of adenomyosis as it is available for most of us in our daily practice. And as Hans said, uh, <clears throat> we also do um, the ultrasound and the surgery. And if it's needed, we have radiologists to do an MRI. But uh, the most important point is that we think in adenomyosis and that we try to diagnose it. Uh, that's the condition for the treatment. And it's the condition for a, a complete counseling of our patients with endometriosis uh, and, and in this uh, point, it's not important whether they have symptoms like bleeding disorders or dysmenorrhea or infertility. In all aspects, it's important. And as Dr. Golor mentioned, also it's important to distinguish uh, adenomyosis from, from fibroids. Now, my topic today is hysteroscopy in patients with adenomyosis, and I think it's um, interesting um, 
surgical field in adenomyosis. Um, first, uh, before I start with hysteroscopy, I, I just would like to show you the new um, hashtag NCN classification of endometriosis, which uh, has been published uh, uh, in February this year. Uh, Hans already showed it to us. Um, I think it's a very important um, classification as it is a comprehensive uh, description system for endometriosis, including all aspects of the disease. Um, and I'm talking about peritoneal lesions, but also deep endo and also adenomyosis. Um, when we <clears throat> have a look at the classification, it's important to know that you can assess it by ultrasound. And that means that you just put a U and that means the ultrasonographer is able to have a pre-surgical classification of the disease. The same can be achieved by MRI. And then you can have the surgical classification of the disease. And the best way is to merge your ultrasound, MRI and surgery, and then have a clear view of the special uh, and individual classification of each patient. Uh, when we talk about uh, adenomyosis, it's the F a, which um, determines uh, adenomyosis in this classification. And as you can see, it would be helpful to have an additional unique adenomyosis classification, which still does not exist. So why is um, adenomyosis of such a great importance. Um, it has a very high incidence and we do not know exactly how high as we heard before in previous years it was just diagnosed by hysterectomy specimen and now we just start to see and to care for adenomyosis so we do not have exact dates on prevalence and incidence uh, in age depending way so we do not know if a 25-year-old infertile patient has got adenomyosis or not, uh, just when we are very good in ultrasound or we have good radiologists who are able to uh, interpret uh, MRI, um, then maybe we can detect it. But still, we are not sure how often adenomyosis plays a role. Um, the uterus is the central reproductive organ. And when you uh, think in the older times we talk about endometrial, uh, uh, about peritoneal endometriosis, about the ovaries, um, and about a lot of details, but uh, we did not care about adenomyosis in the uterus. Most of the patients with adenomyosis have symptoms, another important factor, and adenomyosis, and I think this has been shown clearly so far has a negative impact on fertility. Uh, it can cause uh, reduced pregnancy rates, reduced birth rates and higher abortion rates. And there is also a link to obstetrical complications like premature birth, PPRM, uterine rupture and PPH. So this is what we have in our daily practice and adenomyosis plays an important role. Which are the treatment options? medical treatment, surgical treatment, and of course, reproductive treatment. And there are many options and many things to discuss. I will focus on surgical treatment and on hysteroscopy. The treatment factors for your decision taking are symptoms, family planning, additional deep endo and patient's age. So when we talk about the surgical options, uh, there are many, and as Hans uh, showed, the open surgical resection, the cytoreductive surgery. You can also use laparoscopic resection. You can use radiofrequency ablation. You can use HIFU, which we will uh, listen to later. And now we focus on hysteroscopy. When we uh, resect adenomyosis, it has the effect that the pain is reduced, the bleeding disorders can be reduced, and this is also measurable in terms of CH12.5. There are some uh, examples, and um, I, I just would like to show you these uh, videos because uh, it is important to understand uh, that adenomyosis in some cases uh, is, is 
clearly visible, but in many, many cases, you just find subendometrial microcysts, like in these very young patients. These are typical findings. And here you can see how it looks like when you cut off the specimen out of such a uterus. And this is a three millimeter chocolate bubble. And this is a subendometrial adenomyosis finding, which can cause uh, symptoms and the problems we just heard. So the idea now is what can I do with hysteroscopy? Is it, is it possible to, to uh, see these lesions or to resect these lesions? We will see. Uh, this is a larger diffuse adenomyosis. And of course, here in this case, it's, it's easier to detect. And uh, this is nothing you can treat by hysteroscopy. And what we usually see in hysteroscopy is that the endometrium is irregular with tiny openings on the endometrial surface. We have a hypervascularization. We have the so-called strawberry pattern. We may have fibrous cystic appearance of intrauterine lesions, and we may have hemorrhagic cystic lesions. This is a review from 2017. And of course, the hysteroscopy is always good for the inspection of the uterine cavity, as you just mentioned. So what we do, we do hysteroscopy in all our patients with endometriosis. This is our standard procedure. We use the trophy scope by Carl Storz, which is a three millimeter diagnostic hysteroscope. We do not use any uh, dilatation. We do not use any... Um, any medical pretreatment. Uh, this, this is just the typical standard way to, to do hysteroscopy in all patients with endometriosis. Uh, this is just part of our fertility checkup. Um, and sometimes you have some findings like, for example, here adhesions, or a septum that you can treat. But of course, in most of the cases, there is no finding at all. And you just see a normal uterine cavity and you just can tell your patient, okay, everything's perfect inside. And I can tell you that in many patients that have adenomyosis, the endometrial layer is completely normal. In some cases, uh, it looks like this. This is not, not a... Uh, uh, the video is not running. Well, however, these are uh, typical findings like these brownish cystic lesions, these spots in the endometrium. Um, and sometimes you have these findings in hysteroscopy, but in many, many cases of um, adenomyosis, you just have a healthy, normal uh, endometrial layer. This is an example for a small opening, the tiny opening of the endometrium. It's not the tube, it's, it's an opening to a cystic adenomyosis. This is how it histologically looks like. This is resection of uh, cystic adenomyosis with the bipolar loop. And this is a small uh, adenomyosis lesion within the myometrium. And as you can see, we are just uh, like dwelling in, in, in the depth of the uterus, and then you have an endometrial-like tissue again, which is very interesting when you see it. And of course, it's even more interesting when you have the chocolate coming out. The problem is that when we try to do hysteroscopic resection, the, the, uh, the frequency that we really find our lesions is, is not 100%, of course, because sometimes the lesions are big enough and it's easy to detect them, but sometimes they are very small and then it's really difficult. So if you want um, a histological proof and you want to have a, a small biopsy by hysteroscopy, then it might be difficult to find the lesion. So for example, in the um, actual German and Austrian and Swiss guideline on endometriosis, there is no recommendation for uh, obtaining a biopsy in patients with adenomyosis by hysteroscopy. However, I think it might be important 
And if you combine ultrasound and a hysteroscopic biopsy, you have a more or less high specificity, like in this publication, about 90%. We have some data too, and we were able to find the, his, uh, the, the, the proof, the histological proof of adenomyosis in more or less 50% of those patients uh, with a suspicion of adenomyosis. So you can see that it's not so easy, and of course it depends on the size of the lesion. The problem is that you have a lot of false negative results. Why could a histological proof by hysteroscopy be important? Because it, it might have consequences on the, on, on, on the, on the plan. It, it might have consequences on uh, reproductive treatment, on surgical treatment, and it might be an explanation for the ongoing problems of the patient. And it might also be a factor for the coverage by health, health insurances. So we believe that if you see adenomyosis, you should try to get, uh, get it resected. Um, here is another example. This is a cystic lesion. This is the proof by Doppler that it's not a vessel. And this is um, the result, as you can see. Of course, this is not a hysteroscopic resection. Um, and here you can see how we uh, do um, the biopsy in patients with adenomyosis. In this case, you can see that there's a certain strawberry pattern. There are these um, small lesions in the endometrial layer. This is a, a mini hystero resectoscope. It's a five millimeter resectoscope bipolar, which is really good for fertility patients because you do not have to do a dilatation to eight or nine millimeters. Then you obtain the first layer, which is the layer of uh, endometrium and junctional zone, and maybe uh, a small layer of myometrium. And then in the same tunnel, you take the next layer, which is a deeper one with the myometrium. And then the pathologists have the chance to detect uh, if there is adenomyosis or not. But just to repeat this, of course, in some cases, you need ultrasound in the OR. You need a good description of the localization of the lesion. Here, it's easier because it's bigger and you can just resect it. And then you see the opening in the uterine wall. And uh, this is a, a case of a much larger uh, cystic adenomyosis, which we treated by hysteroscopy. So one thing is, uh, hysteroscopy as a diagnostic tool. And the other thing is hysteroscopy for biopsies. And the third thing is hysteroscopy in use for adenomyosis resection. This patient uh, did not wish to conceive in the future, which means that we can just evacuate the cystic lesion and coagulate it inside like an ablation. Um, but of course, if this patient would uh, have um, an ongoing family planning, uh, it, it would have been much better to do the surgery by laparoscopy in order to suture uh, the uterus or even by open surgery in order to have a good suture on the uterus because this is a large defect of the posterior uterine wall. And you can see that now when the brownish liquid comes out, uh, it's a cystic lesion filled with endometrial tissue. And what we do next is um, the ablation of this area. And this is a minimally invasive treatment uh, instead of hysterectomy. And, and the treatment was successful and she left the hospital without pain. So it would be recommendable to take a small biopsy, a small uh, resectant, resection chip in order to have a, a, a histological result. And then you can do the ablation with a mono or bipolar loop. I recommend that um, 
I recommend that you um, use bipolar because these procedures might take some time. So this is another case that is also adenomyosis. It's cystic, but as you can see, it's it's on the uh, it's on the other uh, it's it's on the sorry. <clears throat> It's not reachable by um, reachable by hysteroscopy. This is a 17-year-old patient, and here's the uterus, and there's the lesion, but it's too large and it's too far away. And that's why we we decided to do this one by laparoscopy, and it's just opening it. Um, and then the resection of the adenomyotic tissue. And this was the hysteroscopy in the same patient. So it, it was completely normal. Any finding, very young patient, 17, as I told you, with severe dysmenorrhea, no bleeding disorders, but dysmenorrhea and absolutely normal uterine cavity. And with a very beautiful endometrial layer, completely healthy. So um, if you do resection of uh, cystic lesions or adenomyosis, of course, it's a save the uterus technique. It's hormone-free. Uh, it has a high impact on bleeding disorders and it, it causes less pain. But of course, there's a uterine wall defect. You have no suture when you do it by hysteroscopy and it might be less safe regarding malignant transformation when we talk about pre or perimenopausal women. So the conclusions are uh, hysteroscopy, uh, from my point of view, should be uh, performed in all patients with endometriosis and ongoing family planning. Uh, hysteroscopic biopsy is not um, really evaluated so far, but might be a good tool in some patients. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you have uh, the visualization during tissue sampling, and it's easy and minimally invasive. Of course, there are difficulties in deep or diffuse adenomyosis. You have false negative results and you have to train your pathologist too. And just one issue, if you do resection and then you want to do a chromoperturbation when you continue with the laparoscopy, it might be a bit difficult as uh, the blue dye just enters the uterine wall and is not leaving the fallopian tubes. So you have to have this in mind. Um, and I would like to take uh, the chance to invite you, if you like endometriosis case discussions to our EEL activity, uh, which runs from time to time, next time, uh, 28th of September, 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, Central European time. It's just one hour of case discussion with Jörg Keckstein, Horace Romand, and Mohamed Mabruk uh, and our young team. And of course, you are all invited to come to uh, Bordeaux, France in June next year to our European Endometriosis Congress. We have a very good program, I think, and it would be an honor and pleasure for us to welcome you to uh, Bordeaux. And I just can say, as Hans said, if you wish to visit uh, our department in Germany, in Duisburg, you're always welcome. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Harald. Uh, very, very lovely presentation. And one thing again that I really want to emphasize, especially for the, our colleagues in Nigeria, which is one of the things I've been discussing with you, is yeah. to see how we also not only train the, the gynecologists that but also the pathologist. And that's one of the things I saw from your presentation, because sometimes you bring out this and they can't make a diagnosis because they've not been trained to see this. So wonderful, thank you so very much. We have a lot of questions 
from what I can see, and then we inherited some also. So I, I think, uh, fine, it's set so many people thinking, and I'm sure we'll benefit greatly from this presentation. So I just go on to talk about um, um, adenomyosis and infertility. So we made a diagnosis, we see that we can use the stereoscope, but we know that a lot of these are patients also have infertility. So how do we treat them? So that's what uh, I'm gonna be uh, talking about in the next 20 minutes or so. Perfect. So thank you so much. And uh, um, yes, adenomyosis and infertility uh, organized by Sogon Endometrosis, European Endometrosis League and Endometrosis Support Group Nigeria. Now this, we uh, hopefully we translate into other things in our activities to train the emphasis is actually in how we can train ourselves to be able to, from Dr. Igolo's point of view, be able to make more diagnosis of um, endometriosis, adenomyosis with a scan. From Krentel's point of view, uh, how we can use the, the stereoscope, which fortunately we're using a lot now more in Nigeria. Uh, from Hans' point of view, how we can use the laparoscope and even uh, the mini lab to treat this condition. So uh, I'll try to start by defining what adenomyosis is, if you are not tired of hearing it, as uh, benign uterine disease characterized by the presence of endometrial glands and stroma surrounded by hypertrophied and hyperplastic smooth muscles deep within the endometrium. So it can be described as endometriosis of the uterus. So we see that most of the time, a lot of time, a lot of doctors and mistake this for fibroids because there is bulky uterus. The symptoms are almost the same, and therefore it's not unusual to misdiagnose as fibroids. The incidence, like we've heard so far, is unknown because we lack standardized definition and diagnostic criteria. Even the new classification is for, for endometriosis, not for adenomyosis. And therefore, prevalence is difficult to estimate is between 5% to 70%. And like we, um, Dr. Igolov pointed out in his own paper, which unfortunately is what still exists in Nigeria, we still diagnosed a lot only by histology. And one of the things we want to take away from this series of activities is to increase our pre-surgical diagnosis of adenomyosis. And uh, we saw there was a paper that was done in JOS recently that they saw up to about 35% of patients who had hysterectomy for fibroids, that about 35% of them actually had adenomyosis with the fibroid. So it's something that is very common here. The risk factors for adenomyosis, of course, is endometriosis. And that's why we're seeing it in younger people now. 40 to 50% of people who have endometriosis will also have adenomyosis. Smoking is also a risk factor. And of course, trauma, when you have done cesarean section, when you've done a recharge in the past, might be risk factors for you to have adenomyosis. Like we said from what you heard all day, the narrative seems to be changing from because of the use of high resolution ultrasound imaging. From the typical story of the multiparous woman in her 40s and 50s, now we're seeing a lot of adenomyosis in our infertility clinics, especially now that childbearing is being delayed. People say in the developed countries, but I think it's all over the world. Well, 30 to 35% of, of patients with adenomyosis might not be diagnosed uh, as symptomatic. So we need to pay more attention in making diagnosis, especially during our fertility evaluation. Because sometimes this is the only time that these patients actually see the gynecologist. You know, maybe they've been seeing other doctors before now. And we know, of course, again, the time interval, usually between the diagnosis, the onset of symptoms in endometriosis and diagnosis being made. And especially in our environment, 
where the, the chance to see the gynecologist might be very reduced, except when they have infertility. Well, from what we've heard from uh, uh, Dr. Krentel, we several studies point to the negative influence of adenomyosis on natural reproduction. And there's several uncontrolled studies because of limited data that suggest that when you treat this adenomyosis also, reproduction or fertility tends to improve. So that is one of the things why even being able to treat adenomyosis with the stereoscope might be very, very important to us, that if you can also debug the adenomyosis, at least this might improve fertility. Now, how do we link, is there any linkage between infertility and adenomyosis? The answer is yes, there is definitely a linkage. And one of the papers I like is this one by uh, Ileara Suhab. I hope I, but she's uh, based in that Italy, working with uh, some Swiss. And some of the things that they described in the paper titled Treatment Options and Reproductive Outcome for Adenomyosis Associated Infertility. Some of the reasons they deduce an anatomical distortions, uterine dysperistalsis, which affects sperm transport and implantation. And they, even a gentleman called Mehesab was able to see the different ultrastructural smooth muscles in adenomyosis, different from the ones in the myometrium. And the loss of nerve, nerve fibers between the endometrium myometrium interface in patients who have adenomyosis. And they also saw the altered vascularization in the secretory phase of the endometrium, which actually alters the implantation when patients try to get pregnant. Not to talk of the molecular markers like uh, uh, vascular EGF and all those cytokines that lead to oxaten gene that are deranged in patients who have adenomyosis. But is there a causal relationship between adenomyosis and infertility? And the answer is no, there is no causal relationship. So the fact that you have adenomyosis does not mean you will have infertility. Okay, and this was pointed out in this paper in 2019 by the group from uh, Milan, Polo uh, Veselini. And so what do we do when we have a patient who has infertility and has adenomyosis? So the first thing is that we must have a comprehensive fertility assessment. We, like we said, the fact that you have adenomyosis does not mean you have infertility, but if you have, then the first thing to do is to do a proper fertility assessment for the man and for the woman. And then we have three options available to us. And this is where actually we need to, the rubber meets the road. Uh, we have three options, either we're considering surgery, we're considering the drugs, or we are, we're considering ART. Now, it depends on who are we talking about. That's why it's important to individualize by doing your fertility assessment. So you look at what are the factors responsible, what is the age of the patient, is this somebody who should be trying natural conception or who can try natural conception? For example, if all you found was just a, 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 a focal adenomyosis, adenomyosis, yeah? Can such a patient try natural conception? But if you are trying natural conception, two options are either open to you. You can try surgery, you can try medications, and you can combine the two together. And if you're trying to do IVF, two options are so available to you. You can try drugs, you can try IVF, and you can combine the two of them. Uh, sorry, you can do IVF alone, and you can combine drugs and IVF together. So for someone who is trying to naturally conceive, I mean, for, like we said, you find a focal lesion, and she probably has the current, she's presented with current miscarriages, it might be important for you to try to do some of the things that uh, uh, both uh, Dr. Krentel and uh, uh, Hans have spoken about. Um, I saw in Hans's presentation a, 
Uh, this man studied been busy, who is from uh, Thessalonica in Greece, who did a systemic review and described three main categories of neutral sparing surgical treatment, which can be complete excision by the myomectomy. Um, it can be partial excision through or cytoreductive surgery, and then you can have the non excisional techniques, which uh, Professor Ali is going to be talking to us about HIFU. And of course, the other one is that you can be talking about uterine artery embolization. Now, when we talk about surgery for complete excision or partial excision, it can be by laparotomy, it can be by, by, by laparoscopy, and like Krenkel described, it can be by stereoscopy. Now, the problem most of the time is to achieve the balance between, like uh, when uh, Hans described the surgical techniques, that's why I asked for the, the stereoscopic finding. So most of the time, your problem is to find the balance between complete removal of adenomyosis and preservation of uterine control. You know? And there's also the risk of uterine rupture in pregnancy. And some even reports have uh, uh, shown that there is some PPH that is not responsive to conservative treatment, which leads to peripartum hysterectomy. And so I saw a question also, elective cesarean section after uterine sparing surgery seems to be the best option for delivery. So all these things are making there to be a push for the non excisional techniques, even for patients who want to do IVF. And that's why Professor Ali's talk is very, very, very important. How we can do some non excisional things, either we're, doing, we're considering high food or we're thinking of uterine artery embolization, of course, and the, the two of them serve different, the, the, the indications that are alike, but at the same time, a little bit different. But of course, we also spoke about the drugs. There are two groups of drugs that we can consider if we are talking about adenomyosis and infertility. The generic agonist, this of course reduces the free radicals in the glandular endothelium by suppressing the expression of nitric oxide synthesis. And of course, they also decrease the P450 aromatase expression, which enhances uterine receptivity. And the second group of drugs are the aromatase inhibitors. And there was a study done in Egypt, which was a prospective randomized control study, and found that there was no difference in volume and symptoms of patients who have adenomyosis at 12 weeks. But one interesting thing he also found that was that the group that were using the aromatase inhibitors, two of them got pregnant, and none of the people who are using GnRH agonists got pregnant. Well, there was nothing to significant to suggest about that, but it was just something that was noticed. So what about IVF in adenomyosis-related infertility? We've looked at surgery, we've looked at medications. Now let's look at about IVF. When it comes to IVF, the data is still conflicting. Although many studies suggest deleterious effect on IVF outcome, that's what also uh, Hara told us. The same way that adenomyosis affect natural reproduction is also affect the outcome of IVF. And one of the thing, good ones that uh, earlier meta-analysis is one done by the group in Milan again. And they had a meta-analysis of nine published data which involved 1,865 women, 306 of which had adenomyosis. They concluded from this study that women with adenomyosis have a 28% reduction in clinical pregnancy rate due to reduced implantation and an increased miscarriage rate. Grace Jones from, the, from Canada also went on to do one recently, um, a, another meta-analysis trying to start from where the Milan group stopped. They did nine studies. She went ahead and looked at 15 studies, 11 of which were observational studies, and four were retrospective studies. And this study involved 2,054 women, 519 with adenomyosis. She obtained also a similar result, but also showed that there was a 41% reduction in live birth rates in women who had adenomyosis. Uh, this is also another review article 
which showed a, another uh, systemic review and meta-analysis, which showed, which is much more recent, just this was released last year, which adjusted for the age of these patients in the study. And he used 17, 17 observational studies and found that they, there was still a lower clinical pregnancy rate in patients who had adenomyosis, and they also have a higher miscarriage rate after ART. And this, he also pointed out this, that this lower clinical pregnancy rate was more significant in patients who use short protocol, either agonist or antagonist down regulation protocol. And he also went to notice that there were some obstetric complications related to uh, adenomyosis, just like Pente pointed out, preeclampsia, preterm delivery, and fetal malpresentation, uh, small for gestational age infants, and uh, postpartum hemorrhage. But this new study that was done this year from Australia by Higgins does not say that adenomyosis does not significantly affect IVF outcome especially when you adjust for confounding factors, including maternal age and smoking status. You know that smoking is a risk factor for adenomyosis. But what about when we use donor eggs? Does, does adenomyosis have any effect when you are using donor eggs? Well, this was done, this was a study done by the group in uh, Valencia, the Spanish group, and they used trans cryptomic analysis of the endometrium of women with adenomyosis. And they showed that implantation rate may not be affected, but my miscarriage rate is definitely higher in patients who have adenomyosis. Now, so the question is why, what do you do in this, when you have this conflicting data, what I call a cacophony, what do you do when you have this conflicting data? So we're gonna to try to look at what, can, what are the things that we can do. And one of the articles that shows that is that there is a lot of publications from China now on adenomyosis, okay? And so that's one of the things that is making us also to call on Professor Ali to talk to us about what their views are, especially when it comes to high food. But this art review article by me uh, was, is one of those ones that looked at what, uh, and it point, she pointed out the importance of prolonged down regulation in uh, success of people who, are, who have infertility and have adenomyosis and are doing IVF. But this prolonged down regulation can be used in two ways. One is that with pretreatment, two to three months before your stimulation, and then you can do fresh transfer or preferably frozen embryo transfer. And also there was also talking about this pretreatment was also this ultra long GNRH agonist protocol, which involves so many spin offs came up. Some people using OCP before they, you start your GNRH analog, or some people actually having two doses of GNRH analog on two different, uh, two different cycles. So this is also a possibility. But the second way to use this uh, prolonged down regulation is that you could actually split your treatment into two. You first do your stimulation, and then you do your prolonged down regulation before you do your FET. So always, you are, you, from the get-go, you are splitting your treatment, into your IVF treatment into two. You are doing your stimulation first, and then you do your prolonged down regulation. We have spoken about the advantages of what the prolonged down, what GNRH uh, agonist does to the endometrium. You want to maximize this advantage and therefore before you do your FET. Of course, this was a, a, a paper that was published by Strelly, who worked together with the Chaperon Group in, in uh, Paris. And they published this and they showed us that you could actually do this, do your prolonged down regulation before you now do your FET. And this is one thing that I actually uh, subscribe to, splitting the treatment into two, but that means your freezing has to be good if you are going to be able to do that. But of course, we can almost take freezing for granted now 
with uh, vitrification. Now, is there any preferred protocol for ovarian stimulation? Yes, the jury is still out. Majority favor the long protocol or the ultra long or the modified ultra long, but people generally believe that uh, you should uh, uh, do prolonged down regulation. I've told you that there are two ways you can do this. You can do is that pre-treatment before your stimulation, and you can do it just before your frozen embryo transfer. And uh, this paper, another one from China, actually told us that antagonist regimen might be inferior to use when you, are, you have a patient with that immunosis. Now, this is one other thing that I think we should take when we're trying to, because if you now have the embryos, your, it means your transfer procedure must be top notch. And so mock transfer, embryo transfer might be something to always do for patients who have adenomyosis. This is because it's particularly important in this group of patients because it may alert the clinician about the peculiarities that eat it. For example, what kind of catheter should you use? Should you get start from the get-go using your stillet due to your trying distortion? But all this information might just be necessary for us to optimize the treatment that these patients are going to have. So I just draw the conclusion by saying that we need to draw more attention to screening for adenomyosis, especially in infertility management. The frequent coexistence of adenomyosis with endometriosis and fibroids might just prove a double whammy for some of our patients who are faced with infertility. There is still limited data available concerning the efficacy of the different treatment options for infertility and therefore still pose a major challenge to gynecologists and fertility experts who are faced with these patients. And adenomyosis may be responsible for a good percentage of repeated implantation failure. I'm sure this is one word that many people who practice IVF really dread, repeated implantation failure. So, but adenomyosis might just be one of the things. So this might be reason, one of the reasons why we need to be able to diagnose more adenomyosis even before our patients start IVF treatment. Well, women with adenomyosis need special counseling when faced with infertility, as they may need multiple attempts, as well as they need good antenatal care due to possible obstetric complications. And I join others to say that we still need to do more than what we're doing now with adenomyosis. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, I think uh, we just, it's just enough time for me to invite uh, Professor Ali to just uh, talk to us about HIFU and uh, adenomyosis. Thank you so much. So for all the speaker previous, they all did a wonderful uh, speech. So for me, it would be easier. And I will share my screen. So here's screen. Okay. Dear all friends in front of the screen from all over the world, it's my great honor to be here to attend this uh, beautiful webinar. My topic is about treatment strategies and the reproductive outcome for adenomyosis, HIFU as a new alternative. Talking about adenomyosis, uh, the three gentlemen we should remember. Like first case we found in 1816 and uh, Cullen gives the first discrimination and Simpson is kind of the father of the adenomyosis. So again, coming. Dr. Ajayi, uh, the screen is normal. I can see you, it's good. Yes, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. So we should simply talking about the history and some reason for adenomyosis. So in 18, uh, 1908, 
Kulin proposed the basal layer endometrial invasion as a cause of adenomyosis, which may be related to the lack of submucose in the endometrium. Adenomyosis originates from the invagination of the bacillus of the endometrium into the myometrium. The bacillus invagination proceeds along the intromyometrium lymphatic system, a metaplastic process initiated from ectopic intromyometrium endometrial tissue. So here we should realize the problem for adenomyosis, the disease of uh, the root of the disease is endometrium, endometrium tissue. For simple clinical feature, we all know adenomyosis showing increase of uterine size, and the big problem is pain, dysmenorrhea, and some patient will suffering from anemia. And uh, about infertility, Dr. Ajayi gave us a very good details already and the hepamase abortion. So anything's not coming pure simply. So and endometriosis also usually occurs in 50% uh, what's happened then? You may okay. Per uh sorry, my computer has some problem here. This my screen disappears suddenly. No, but we can see your screen. I think it's from your really? end. Yeah, we can see your screen. But I can't move it, sorry. Suddenly stopped here. I will try again. Connect again. Sorry. Now it's okay. Perfect. Now well, it's coming wrong way. <laughs> okay. So from the back here. So yes, and about the fertility, Dr. Ajayi gave us very good details already. So this is about adenomyosis, pathologically myometrium hypertrophy was mainly observed with island-shaped endometrium gland and stroma distributed between the myometrium wall and smooth muscle fiber hyperplasia. This picture just look page. And uh, for ultrasound, I believe every audience already get good information from Dr. Kinsley. He gave us a very good information from ultrasound and the uterine um, MRI uh, feature we will talk later. So we can see the mix and the scanter in multiple spots with higher signal foci. So for treatment, we already know we have drug treatment uh, and some surgical treatment. I will focus on the new style, high food. So we should know, including any traditional technique like uh, myomectomy, adenomyomectomy, we should think about what will happen later when the patient has during the pregnancy. So there are some data report will happen obstetric complication such as uterine rupture. This is a case from another hospital. Also for hysterectomy is not easy for some women, they wouldn't like lose uterus. So what happened after hysterectomy, loss of sexual desire, that is a very important thing in women's life and the insomnia. And another big problem for some of women with SUI and POP, uh, pelvic disease. About Haifu, I want to simply introduce, this is a new technique no invasion, no bleeding, no transfusion, and the rapid recovery. I will show the very simple video here. So, okay.
So we can see the patient just lying on the bed. So while treating, the patient can listening to music at the same time, just relax and lie there. The lower abdomen is soaked in water like a spa. So it can be said to be a very comfortable treatment. Simple history about typhoon. In 1927, Wundu report on the physical and the biological effect on focus ultrasound. In 1942, Lin, uh, this man is uh, related some brain research. So they put some technique, but uh, in the end, they have were filled. In 1950s, Fry show high focus could effectively ablate target tissue without affecting the surrounding structure. In 1997, Wang Zhibiao, who is a uh, inventor for high food, made the first therapeutic system and conducted the first in man application for the treatment of bone cancer. So I, I saw these patients last year. They create the miracle. The family is very ha happy. And HIFU was first used for gynecological disease like fibroid in 2002, adenomyosis in 2008. I will talk about the very uh, principle, the mechanism about HIFU. High food tumor therapeutic system convert electric energy into acoustic energy through a transducer, just the yellow color stuff. And the ultrasound emitted by the transducer is focused onto target tissue to confer treatment. The temperature at the biological focal region to just at the inside of the fibros can suddenly arise over 65 degree. And the irreversible, irreversibly coagulation, cause coagulation, cause necrosis immediately. High full efforts one time precise resection via conformal ablation of the lesion under the real time monitoring by either ultrasound or MRI, usually ultrasound. So if the doctor very familiar with ultrasound, it can handle easier. So high food system already installed in all around the world in nearly 30 country. So this is a big data center. It can connect uh, everywhere. So in China, we can see nearly every province we already have full machine. The left side the picture we can see the all around the world. So take uh, the happen problem again. I will share. So I'm not sure what's happened for here. yeah, yesterday we tried very good, so I'm not sure. Okay. Again, okay. When we do in high food, a very important thing for classification. So today we already learned from Hans and the previous speaker, we have new system about classification. So that is very important. But this is our experience about classification. We, according to the traditional way, like focal and the diffusion, and we divide into A, B, C. A means uh, nearby the endometrium, B outside the uh, nearby the sub, sub series, C is a neutral style. For diffusion, also divide into the diffusion, endogenous, diffused, X genius and the diffuse intramural three three step are different adenomyosis uh, will require the different treatment strategy so for high food the best one is diffuse the endogenesis type and the diffuse intramural subtypes 
For the purpose of HIFU, very simple, selective and precise ablation of adenal myosis lesion and reduce the scope of the lesion. Loss of endometrium function in ectopic endometrium. The very important thing is relieve the symptom. So this is a data. We begin from 2050, the end of the year, but now we finished the more than 2000 cases. We increased gradually. So in whole China, we are in the third line. So every year nearly for more than 400. From this table, we will see the most of the patient we treat are adenomyosis, the green color, especially recent years. So our, our treatment strategy uh, divided the three steps. The first step is high food. The second step, we will use kind of medication like GnRHA and the progesterone, so any medication the easier to get. The last step is resection of endometrium. So at the beginning, we mentioned that this kind of disease mechanism is endometrium. So the third step, we usually will do the resection of endometrium through his, uh, hysteroscopically. This is a paper we published two years ago for three steps. So this is a very typical case we done. So we will see from the picture A, posterior and adenomyosis lesion here before treatment, one day after high flu, we can see the ablation area nearly 90%. And just 80 days after high food, from picture C, we can see the beautiful normal uterine side. So I call this technique like as magical as a work of art. So very big uterus, just the 18 days can come in through the normal size. The beauty of the non-invasive technique so just like a turnip, I have several patients after very huge myoma absorbed completely and after adenomyosis disappear. So the uterus size in the pelvic world through MRI, we found that the shape of the uterus like turnip, very beautiful. So here I will show the four minutes videos for all audience to show how the high food work. But I suddenly find the, the problem coming again. We can't running the video. Okay, I see. Maybe in the future we can see. It's a very interesting video actually. The whole procedure we can see easily. But after high food, we can see the improved VIS score and also menstrual volume score can reduce and also reduce the uterine volume and increase the hemoglobin level. And the very typical marker CA125 can dramatically reduce so we will give the conclusion, the three-step approach, high food, GNRJ, and the marina. It has lower risk of hysterectomy. It's safe, effective, and efficient. It can improve the quality of life, especially for the patient with localized adenomyosis. I will share several successful cases. The first case is, 42 years, five years of dysmenorrhea associated with this type of menorrhagia. So we have uh, many patients getting through traditional treatment like GNRJ several time, put marina, fallout, field. So this patient also 
accept the three, six times of JNRJ and the one times Marina without symptoms improving. So from this picture, the right side picture, we can see just one day after high full ablation, the whole the lesion ablated nearly completely and then we cause the hardship lesion. The patient will be happy. Heart means low. So after three months, the uterine size come, coming normal and we will do the step three hysteroscopic surgery to resect all the endometrium and put marina. And we sending the tissue to the biopsy. The pathology result is high for treatment induced the high grid degeneration of adenomyotic tissue. So this is uh, about video for TCRE. So it can't work again. Another case is just the 31 adenomyosis with severe dysmenorrhea and the menorrhagia for four months. The very fresh case. So from picture, we can see the mostly posterior adenomyosis lesion. And, but this ablation area is not very beautiful, but also it can work. The case three, we can see the very huge adenomyosis. One day after I fall, we can see another hardship ablation area. And six months later, the last picture is 16 months post high fall, smaller, much smaller. And another case 32, severe dysmenorrhea for four years. So from here, we can see the ablation area, very beautiful. I want to show the multiple myoma, another different cases. So here we can see this patient very young, 29, haven't um, married when, when she accept treatment. She used the six time JNRJ without symptom improving also. The diagnosis is diffuse uterine leomyotis. So we can see we give two times ablation. One day after the first time of HIFU, most fibroid ablated. Three months later, we can compare the third picture with the first picture. The size of the uterus shrinks smaller, very beautifully. This patient, 30 years, Four years of myoma, so we can hear posterior myoma. One day after ablation beautifully, and just three months later, we can see much smaller. And the shape of the uterus is very beautiful. So the patient can easily pregnant later. This paper showing the high food treatment does not affect ovarian reserve. And the pregnancy outcome also very good. Here we can show in the conclusion. So this is 68 adenomyosis patient and 54 subsided in pregnancy after high food. And the average pregnancy time is six, eight months. In 54 patients who had a successful pregnancy, there were no symptomatic uterine rupture or rupture during pregnancy or delivery. So high full ablation has no obvious adverse effect on normal uterine world and does not increase the risk of uterine rupture during pregnancy and the delivery. Hypoablation may improve uterine moment and uterine cavity. Hypoablation result in the relief of clinical symptom in adenomyosis patient with fertility design. Our strategy about uh, adenomyosis is uh, combination therapy. 
So we will choose a big lesion for HIFU. And after HIFU, we also combined with medication. But for some doctors, they like to do hysteroscopic surgery, laparoscopic surgery, laparotomy, both are okay. We should choose a suitable technique for the patient. So in our center, we have uh, 77 cases naturally pregnancy and 19 cases accepting IVF. Both of them deliver successfully. So for the adenal patient, we, we think should take individualized treatment. For small lesion without the desiration for pregnancy, we recommend the TCRE resection through hysteroscopically and put marina. Large lesion without the desiration for pregnancy, after high food, we will give TCRE also. So combine the most suitable unique skill. So this is our cases, our first high food baby in her 32 months, she accept MRI to check the baby. So we can see the myoma before treatment nearly four centimeter. But during the pregnancy, the myoma shrank gradually to 2.5. So this patient is our first type of baby. So we also have a milestone for 1,000 kisses, hypho baby, also the very beautiful baby here. So our patients give us flowers, monkey, and this one is 1,000 hypho baby. So we also create a club to help the patient. As we know, especially adenomyosis, the woman with adenomyosis or endometriosis usually have depression, anxiety. So we uh, established a club to help the patient, including doctors and young doctors and patients. We were together sharing the experience to help the patient. For myself, actually at the beginning, I have a laparotomy skill. And then I have a laparoscopic surgery I trained my primary laparoscopic skill in Australia with Peter Maher and James Salters, and also in Stanford with Cameron Nizat. So maybe we all know in America, US, they have three brothers, or they are very brilliant. And uh, from 2050, with Wang Zhibiao professor, I changed to the high food therapy, now bleeding, now scar. But for myself, I can do hysteroscopic surgery, laparoscopic surgery, laparotomy, also high food. We usually choose the right skill to the right patient, which is the best to choose for the patient. So I also build my team. So I can't do anything by myself individually. So I have several students together and I will give my summary. Effective treatment of symptomatic adenomyosis requires classification of the disease. Adenomyosis negatively impact fertility and obstetric outcome. So Dr. Ajayi already gave us a very good detail. The third surgical myomectomy has a risk of surgical complication. HIFU has the advantage of non-invasiveness, favorable safety profile, quick recovery, and uh, retrieve capability. HIFU can selectively ablate the concentrated gradular muscle lesion, reduce the scope of the lesion, and the, can the ectopic endometrium loss the function. And the combined approach like HIFU, medication, and TC, RE, resection of endometrium is required for the effective management of adenomyosis. HIFU may be particularly suited for the patient with pregnancy desire, but requires more clinical study. 
And thank you so much and sorry for my beautiful video. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Ajayi. I thank, thank you mind. so very much. <laughs> thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. I think we've learned quite a number of things. And um, the pre president of Sogon is with us. I don't know whether he wants to say one or two things before we go to questions. Because we'll have quite a number of questions and I think from the questions we we'll just end. I don't know if the president or the secretary want to say anything because I see the two of them are with us. Okay, um, hello, uh, Professor Ajay. Thank you very much for organizing this uh, very highly educative um, uh, session. And uh, you've selected very good speakers who have done an excellent job on their presentation. Uh, I, don't, I don't know why you say it's not something that we commonly think about in our clinics. We only think of fibroid. So bringing it up to the, this level, is, I think it's very, very important so that our young gynecologists can have it at the back of their mind, not only think of fibroid, but also think of uh, adenomyosis, which is quite common uh, uh, in this environment. So thank you very much. I appreciate all the speakers. They've done an excellent job. And I can see um, everybody is, uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of questions being asked. So uh, it's really um, good to see uh, this large gathering of uh, excellent um, surgeons. One of them is a surgeon, she's a laparoscopic surgeon and uh, the high food. So thank you very much. We do appreciate this kind of uh, gathering from time to time so that we can educate um, uh, people. I think I'm also happy with the attendance. I can see easily all over 200 people are attending this session. So it's really um, um, uh, very good. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ayumi Ajayi. Thank you. Thank you, President. Yeah, so I think we just go to the questions and you, we have a lot of them. Uh, we take as many as we can and then we call it a day. The others will definitely answer and send to you. The first question, can Zoladex be used to treat adenomyosis? Should a patient diagnosed with fibroids, endometriosis, and adenomyosis please on Zoladex for six months, yet experiencing monthly periods with heavy blood clots be worried? People say Zoladex makes you miss your periods, but the periods did not cease for six months. Okay, this is a patient who is asking whether she been on Zoladex for six months. Zoladex is a regenerative uh, agonist for six months and she's still bleeding, whether she should be worried, okay? Um, well, it does happen sometimes, maybe I just did that so because we have so many questions. It does happen sometimes that you, you still bleed even when you're on Zoladex. We expect that some people will not bleed, but some people still go on bleeding. And so, uh, but there are other things that we need to look at. What other symptoms, apart from bleeding, do you have any, symptoms that show that you're, you are being down-regulated as it were. Or what about the fibroids? Is there anything happening with the fibroids? So I think it's a question you should ask, talk, discuss with your doctor, but I don't think you should be worried just because you are bleeding. Uh, this is, how do you exclude the cyst in adenomyosis from the genetic fibroids and the echogenic shadows from calcified intramural fiber using TVS? That's for you, uh, Kingsley. It was clearly displayed in the live um, images that I said. Uh, Majid Dohom had said clearly that the best way to um, display the images for adenomyosis is um, ultra video clips. And in the video clips, you saw it. The cysts in adenomyosis, they are echogenic. You see an echoic central point and then the echogenic rim that surrounds it. The echogenic rim are actually what is described as the echogenic island. To understand this, you need to understand the pathophysiology of how the adenomyosis begins. First, there's a migration of endometrial tissue in sub-endometrium, and they come out as lines and bolts or small tissues, and then they migrate into the myometrium, and then they become larger. The central point of those migration now begin to menstruate, and the menses cannot exit. It is the local that 
it forms from that menstruation that forms the cyst. So they appear as anechoic lesions. And then when you put on, switch on your Doppler, you see that there is transmission of vascularity. Unlike um, in uh, 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 the uh, degenerating fibroids, you will just see the circular flow that surrounds it. That distinguishes it clearly. Then the echogenic island from Michamura fibroid, same, same, same situation. Doppler is the key. If you do not have Doppler, then you have a problem with distinguishing those three clearly. Did not open the okay. voice, Dr. Ajayi. Your voice I can't hear you, is not sir. Open. Yes. I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm falling victim to this. Okay. I'm not sure if I heard right. I heard that the tourniquet on the uterus can be left for up to six hours. I need confirmation and clarification of this statement because many of us will not want to exceed one hour during myomectomies. Can one leave tourniquet in place for this long during myomectomies? This is so John asking. I think uh, uh, that would be a question for normally it should have been for hand. So since you are is, uh, inheriting his uh, assets, Dr. Krentel. Yes. Um, well, I when when we do uh, the Osada procedure, which, which is a surgery that we do in very rare cases, because there are some, some risks related to the surgery, like loss of uterus, like heavy bleeding, uh, but also there is a high risk of uterine rupture during pregnancy or delivery. So this is something that should be last exit. And I think we have seen uh, very good results by non-invasive techniques like HIFU and maybe radiofrequency ablation can have uh, similar results in the future. So um, when we do the procedure, I, I do not use that U suture that Hans showed. I, I don't have any experience with that. So I, I am sorry, but I cannot answer this, uh, this question. There, there was another question about um, probable adhesion uh, uh, problem no, in the I cavity. I think I can answer the question, sir. Sorry? If you do not mind, I think I can answer the question. I, I do a lot of adenomyotic surgery repairs. Mm -hmm. So I have experience with that. And he's correct. You can, you know, there's this, to be honest, you know, um, when you look at this in the practicality of it is what we need to look at. When we were residents, they told us that when you are doing my vectomy, um, release the tonic every 20 minutes, release the tonic. The reality is that when you're operating, you cannot do that. That's the honest truth. When you're doing adenomyosis surgery, you've severed the uterus into two compartments. You cannot release your tonic and retire it. And those surgeries take a minimum of three hours. So I have done adenomyosis surgery for, the longest I've done was nine hours for a particular patient. And I left the tonic institute for that nine hours. Patient is doing fine now, but we'll go just recruited her into an IVF cycle. And then we're going to uh, possibly conclude the IVF. Endometrium is very fine. Uterus is fine. When we scanned her uh, most recently, just before we recruited her for IVF, we did um, hysteroscopy for her, and the endometrium was quite beautiful. So she has no endometrial issues anymore regarding fertility. So yes, you can leave the tonic for longer than six hours that um, the um, German soldier said, and I've done that, and I've seen that, and I have patients who came out with um, good um, endometrium afterwards. Yeah, one should just be, we should be a little bit careful about the pronouncements when there is no data. To, what is the effect on the ovaries? If you leave, leave for, for nine hours, I'll be, I'll be scared. You know, what is the effect on the ovarian reserve? The, the depriving the ovaries of the blood for such a long period of time. I think we should, those are things that we should not just uh, make a decision based on one or two patients. Is it something that we need to probably see if there's any literature on, and um, uh, that's what my own opinion. And I, I would like to add that when you do the OSADA triple flat technique, you usually do not leave any space 
for uh, hematoma. That's the intention of this suturing. So there, there should not be any uh, space left between the flaps. And, and then you may have a lower risk and maybe the, the, the suture is not necessary at the end. Uh, so far, we did not do this suture and we did not have any problems with bleeding. But yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, we have to ask, uh, ask Hans the next time. <laughs> okay, that definitely will be the next time. Um, okay, um, so how, how do you differentiate adenomyosis from endometrial cancer on ultrasound with loss of boundaries? The, the, um, the, the key is that this endometrial cancer is endometrial. You scan and you see that the endometrium is larger than normal. Adenomyosis is a disease of the myometrium, not of the endometrium. So the distinction is not quite difficult. When you scan and you see that the patient has endometrial cancer, the, it's the endometrium. The endometrium is larger than normal. There may be some infiltration, of course. There may be some infiltration into the um, subendometrium, the hollow. But that can easily be distinguished from uterine fibroids. The size of the endometrium and then Doppler. In endometrial CA, you have a Doppler score of four. And then in the adenomyosis, you may have Doppler score of two to three, not essentially four. So those are the two um, things that you can use to distinguish them. Sub uh, endometrial deposits like lungs and boards are just minor deposits in the subendometrium, and the endometrium is particularly fine, no issues in adenomyosis. The key is that endometrial CA affects the endometrium, not the myometrium. I thought what you'd be concerned with is uh, a sarcoma instead of an endometrial CA. In a sarcoma, again, the Doppler will help you because the Doppler will show increased vascularity uh, of the myometrium as against for adenomyosis where the vascularity is three, two to three, not essentially four. Wonderful. If, if I may add uh, something to that answer, um, th there is a certain risk that you might miss an endometrial cancer arising in adenomyosis when you have, um, for example, a peri or postmenopausal patient, and uh, this patient has myometrial adenomyotic cysts that can be a cancer developing inside. Of course, this is a rare condition, but it's difficult to distinguish these two diseases by ultrasound. And there's one thing that I have to add because usually when endometrial cancer starts, the first sign is the postmenopausal bleeding. And when it's a cystic myometrial lesion, it might be a failure of this first sign of cancer. So you have a subgroup of post or perimenopausal and adenomyosis patients. Uh, and when they, for example, take hormone replacement therapy or tamoxifen for breast cancer treatment, uh, maybe in this subgroup, hysterectomy could be helpful to avoid any problems because it's difficult to check whether there is something irregular or not. But it's just a small group of patients, of course. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, there's so <laughs> I'm trying to get some. Any effect of HIFU on the endometrium? That is for Professor Alton. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Beg pardon, which question? She's, a doctor is asking, any effect of, the, of HIFU on the endometrium? Does HIFU have any effect on the endometrium? Oh, yeah, it's it, depending on the um technique process so we will focus on the processing area so usually we will leave the endometrium 1.5 centimeter it never happened to destroy the endometrium or influence the endometrium first but depending on the technique when you are doing usually would not happen would not affect after high food our experience easily to get pregnant because in China may, you know, just last year before they had a family planning. So one child policy, so many women around 40 or larger than 40 years old. 
she wouldn't like have a baby, but after high for treatment, easily pregnant. And finally, they accept the abortion is not good. So I wouldn't like my patient had abortion is not a beautiful thing. So our experience after high for very easy to get pregnancy. And some of my patients said that it belonged to the high food side effect because they suffering nearly 10 years pain that was not pregnant nearly 10 years. So after high food suddenly pregnant, so they can't leave. So what happened and uh, had the abortion. So, so, and we will give the patients very severe recommendation after high food should taking the oral contraceptive pill to prevent pregnancy casually. Thank you, will not influence endometrium. Yeah, so yes. she, Dr. Ali is telling you that uh, what we do is that we avoid the endometrium. So we give a 15 mm uh, space to, yes. because you know, high is for cost treatment. So you avoid the endometrium. Give it yeah, a space yes. for 15 mm. We will keep the safe dis distance from endometrium, from sub subserious bowel, anything, just focus on the lesion. Yeah, Dr. Ritsu has made some comments here. Um, and also uh, Dr. Akiola, they made some comments here. Um, yep, um, let me see, because I want us to finish up in two minutes time so that everybody can. I'm so grateful that there's so many of you are still on. And um, ah, okay, Doctor, this was talking about edema formation, sim post postonicate, and is usually reversible. Yeah, okay, noted. Um, yeah, somebody asked a question. Okay, will GNRH treatment not alter natural fertility potential? Oh, regarding ovulation capacity. Um, if so, how would treatment? of adenomyosis using generate impact on improving natural fertility potential. Yeah, actually it's not improved well, it's improving it because the, your receptivity, uterine receptivity improves. We talked about how it lowers the aromatic, uh, P450 P aromatase. Um, and so we, we that's how we can use, um, reduces uh, the radicals, free radicals in the endometrium and therefore it, improves on the ability of the endometrium to actually fertilize. And that's one of the advantages that we have. Because you know, if you're doing IVF and you want to do the pre-treatment, you might not, especially for low responders, you might not get many yeah, eggs. Yeah. But for people who are normal responders, you might get something. But that's why we're now looking at, okay, we can do the, the prolonged down regulation after you have done your ovarian stimulation, and then you do a frozen embryo transfer. So, but also for natural pregnancy, it improves natural pregnancy. Thank you so much. I think at this point, we will just have to let go, although I still want to stay here, but I'm sure so many of us have been here for over two, like two and a half hours are here now. So uh, thank you so much for being part of this. So gone the president for creating time, the secretary for being here, it's wonderful. Oh, and the presenters, what can I say? You guys have just been lovely. Uh, send me well to Hans when you see him. Harald, wonderful presentation. Kinsley, mm, uh, Professor Ali, Ali. wonderful. And so I need to mention some of the people who made this possible. The, the companies that made this possible, Eb, uh, electromedicine, uh, the Fibro Care Center, and the ESDN, uh, and of course, our partners, Haifu in Chongqing, China. Thank you so much for making this possible. And EEL, this is just the beginning. So what I will just say to Nigerians is watch this space. All right, then. <laughs> See you guys. And thank you See for you. being part of it. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Thank you Bye. all Bye. audience. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. <laughs>